All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to start now talking about the, the LangChain produ production ingestion webinar. Um, and so some minor logistics before we get started. This is being recorded. Um, it will be available at this link. Um, after the fact, we'll also put it up on YouTube um, probably uh, tomorrow or on Friday. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, we're going to spend a bunch of time at the end answering them. So please put them uh, not in the chat box, that which you guys are in by default, but uh, on the right, there's a little box with a question mark. Please put them in there. Um, and, and then you can also upvote the ones that you like the best. And so then at the end, um, we'll go through and kind of answer them um, in that order. As far as the agenda, I'm going to be joined today uh, by, by Joe from Airbyte, and I'll let him introduce himself shortly. And then also Kevin from Sweep, who's having a bit of internet issues. Hence the delay in getting started, but we'll hopefully join um, shortly. Um, and, and so basically what we'll do is we'll, we'll have kind of like uh, 10 minute presentations by each of them. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into questions and answers generally on anything related to production, um, ingestion, ingestion of unstructured data, injection of structured data, anything like that. Um, so lots of times for questions. So please put all the questions that you have in, in the chat box because we will do our best to, to get to all of them. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, we can probably get started with you now, Joe. So do you want to introduce yourself and then maybe jump right into it? Sure. So just share my screen real quick. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm Joe. I'm working there, but uh, I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm mostly coming from the front end uh, world, actually. Uh, but in the last few months, I've been working a lot with um, Python on on the backend side, and also getting into the whole AI topic. And I will talk a bit about like the the current state of what I've learned so far, basically, in this, in this talk. So, week week. Um, to set the context, what is Airbyte and um, why is it relevant in, in this context? So on a very high level, everybody is just about moving data from point A to point B. So it's moving data from some kind of source to some kind of destination. Very often the source is something like um, a blob storage S3 or an Azure, or it's, a, it's an API, like the GitHub API, and B is a database or a warehouse, and it's about centralizing the data there. If you're coming from the um, from the data scientist world, then Airbyte is an ELT provider. Um, so this means extract, load, transform. Extract being getting data out of the source, load, putting it into the destination. And then uh, very often there's also some, tra some transforms going on. And Airbyte is mostly focusing on the extract and the load. And transform is also possible, but it's not, it's not the, the main focus, as it's basically outsourced in this platform. Uh, Airbyte has tons of sources, so there's over 300 out of the box sources you just need to configure in, in, a, in a simple web UI. Mostly this is about configuring things like um, credentials and how exactly you want to extract your data. And then there's 60 plus destinations where you can move the data to, and then you can just set up a connection from one source to one destination and run it on a schedule um, every day or something like this to keep um, the data um, in sync between, between these two, between these pairs. And this is mostly about centralizing data in one place so you can do analytics on it. You can run the Airbyte platform either in a self-managed way on Docker Compose, on a single machine. You can use Kubernetes to run it um, in a distributed fashion in, in your own cluster. But there's also a cloud service where you just need to sign up and then and everything's managed for you and you just need to mint the account. So why should you do this? Um, most people, and I'm definitely myself included, when they are um, faced with a problem of moving data from A to B, they get started with writing some short Python script because it's really simple, right? It's just about hitting an API and then you get back some JSON and then you need to mangle it a little bit and then you can put it into um, some destination. Very often there's a Python client for that, so it's, it's not a big deal, right? But this is not where it ends. This is just where it starts. Over time, you need to load data from a lot of sources and at some point it becomes very expensive to, to run the the full sync every time. So you want to do incremental syncs and only um, sync the records that changed in the source since you did the last sync, especially when you keep want to keep things up to date. And 
um, you need to run transformations in the destination. Things start failing for random reasons. Maybe the API is down, you talk to normally, and you need to retry things. You need to add observability and, and all of these things. And this is what Airbyte solves for you. So you have those sources and destination out of the box. You can also easily develop custom connectors, source and destination side, either using Python or even like if you're doing a REST API, if you want to fetch data from a REST API, then there's a UI which will probably get you going in under 10 minutes. Um, and all of this can be managed from, from a UI. So you have an overview of the current state of all your running pipelines. You know whether some of them are lagging or failing or something like this. As I mentioned, there's automatic retries. It will back off if it's, if, if it's hitting an API too, too quickly. Um, if, if a thing fails because of an outage, then it will retry it for one or two times before notifying you that something went wrong. That's just giving you um, a production-ready orchestration layer over this whole beta movement topic, which um, if you just get started, works with a Python script, but um, over time, especially when you scale, you run into, you keep running into, everyone runs into the same problems and these are just solved in one place here. <clears throat> so what is specific to like AI use cases or use cases that involve LLMs here? Um, there are destinations that support uh, like the commonly used vector databases, and um, what is the sound? There's, there's a weird sound at my end. There is a weird yeah, I'm hearing that too. I mean, is that maybe you? Oh, okay. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh, I, just, I, um, I muted him so that I'm going to try unmuting you, Kevin, but there was some weird noise coming before, so let's see. Oh. Right, should, I, should I just keep going? Yeah. All right. So on the AI side, there's, um, there's, as I mentioned, there's vector databases you can move the data into. And these the specific, these special destinations, um, they, they're not just loading your data as it is, like as a JSON pop or something into the database. And they also um, do the chunking and embedding of your data um, in transit. So basically it's all managed by Airbyte. And then you will end up with a, with a vector database that's loaded with um, with, with a bunch of documents that contain the metadata that got carried over from the source and the text portion of your records will be um, chunked up um, in a configured way and embedded so you can um, get started using um, using uh, vector-based similarity search on it. And, and, so, and so here, Joe, I have a question. When you select kind of like the text fields to embed, that means you're, for each chunk, you're putting those things into the text, then you're creating embedding. Are, are you like... Um, like, how do you put those into the text? Like, how is that formatted into the text before you create the embedding for it? Great question. So um, this is, yeah, you're configuring the fields in your record. So yeah, I mean, maybe I should explain it a little more. And the, the main uh, main concept in, in Airbyte is a record. So each um, source emits um, a series, a sequence of records, and the destination receives those, and he has to store them somehow, in this case, um, every record is a JSON blob, and the text fields that are configured here are basically in that JSON blob that are text fields, so you need to embed them. And what's happening here is that it collects all of these text fields and then concatenates them into one long string with new lines in between and the, the field of the, the name of the field um, 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 prepended to it. So you, you get from all of your text fields in your record, you get one large um, string. And that string is chunked, defined like based on a chunk size, and then each chunk is embedded separately, like by sending it to um, an embedding service like the OpenAI embedding API. Got it. Got it. But in because of this this process, um, it's especially important that it's possible to do incremental updates here. So if um, for example, the GitHub in the GitHub case, like there's a GitHub source, and you can you can connect the the issues um, stream from that source to your destination. Uh, the originally you need to go through all your issues. You can't help with that. But after that point, once you have loaded all of your um, issues, then there will be they will change on a much lower rate. So for each um, subsequent sync, you only need to 
and go through the new issues or the issues that change. And you only need to embed those, re-embed those. So what, what this destination is doing is that it's, it's making sure the, and the stale and vectors are deleted from the database and updated with the new ones. And you don't need to worry about this. This is one of those things you would need to take care of manually once you like want to move to a production system that doesn't like rebuild the whole world from scratch every time. And how does that play with like the chunks in particular? Right? So for like if if I have like a GitHub issue and it gets chunked into like three sub chunks, are you checking to see if each of those sub chunks has changed or are you just assuming that they've all changed and, and deleting them and then re-indexing them? Exactly. This is per record. So it is um it is not tracking whether the actual text changed per chunk. It is only tracking whether the record, which is identified by some ID, in, in case of the GitHub issue, it's pretty easy, right? There is a, there is an ID for the, for the issue. And when that somehow changed, then uh, it's ran for that issue. So yeah, there, there might be some redundant work. So it's not, it's not trying to, it's, it's not reaching out to the destination to see whether, and to do, to do a check whether it, the text actually changed. That would be one, one interesting optimization we, which could, could be added. And then, do you do any like, and this is like, do you do any kind of like cleaning of the text as well, right? So like, the chunking is kind of like one transformation, but you could imagine like stripping HTML tags or like formatting HTML as like Markdown or something like that. Do you do any of that? Yeah, that's a good point. I will get to that in a second. Um, okay. Short answer, no, and long answer, in yeah, in in, in a few slides. But yeah, just a disclaimer here, this is in early stages, so we are currently um, evolving that and, and trying. I mean, I think we released this destination um, a few weeks ago, so we um, it, it will probably like, gain a lot of additional functionality and features over time, and we'll get more robust. Uh, right, so just to, to, on a, to see this on a high level, um, what I talked so far about and where, where the data cleaning is an interesting um, point is um, how the data flow looks like when you're just plugging your source directly into the vector database using Airbyte. So you have some sources, for example, GitHub issues or um, some documents you have stored on a, on, on a um, blob storage. And um, you can connect them to Airbyte and Airbyte is running, um, it's, it's doing the chunking and the embedding just as they are coming from the source. And then it's putting those into the vector database. And from there, a Python application using Langchain can and query that vector database and yeah, integrate with an LM service to provide some functionality. But there's definitely cases where the data from the source might need to be um, processed in some more complex way. Um, and really the sky's the limit here, right? So for example, there's cases where you want to fetch um, some information from multiple sources and then join them together somehow uh, and to, to produce like one one unit, one document you want to put in into into the into the vector database as a single thing, and um, to provide context to the LLM in um, later on. And, and for these cases, uh, there there's a there. You, what you can do is introducing a staging um, step in between. So instead of directly connecting your source to the vector database, there's you there's a, a warehouse or something else, like some intermediate step where you dump the data from the sources. And then this is the place where you can can run more complex transformations on it, like cleaning it or joining mm -hmm. things together, um, all this kind of stuff. And then from there, you can pick it up again and move it to the vector database as in, a, in a second connection. So you can string them together like this. And how does how does someone like configure those transformations? Like what would that well, like what would that practically look like? Would that look like are those two like I guess like are those two connections like completely independent and then you just assume like in between the times that they run there's some transformation that gets done or is there still some like DAG that gets executed here in terms of like yes yeah, so there's multiple ways um a common way which is used which you can use on on warehouses like like Snowflake is DBT. Uh, so DBT is a service which allows you to run um transformations on, on data in your warehouse. You can either use SQL for that or Python. And, and you can also, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's just on Airbyte Cloud, but you can also like kick off these transformation shops directly from the first Airbyte connection. Yeah. Right, and then in the end, right, the, the rest still works the same way. This is, by the way, this, this whole staging thing is, um, is a, is a good practice anyway, because 
um, sources, especially API sources, can be fairly unreliable. Right? They can have outages and they're often um, aggressively rate limited. So it takes a long time to pull out your data. And because of that, moving it from the source into the warehouse first is, um, is good because now you have, you have it safe and sound, right? And you can play with applying different transformations on it and before loading it into a vector database. So this, the second, you can just run the second pipeline multiple times without having to reload from the very source again, which might be relatively expensive. But since the state is still tracked between the steps, you can, can still do, do this in an incremental way. I mean, especially during this is probably important. Why, like, Im embeddings are also kind of like a transformation, right? And there's also the same thing where if you load documents from Notion, like the Notion API, you know, it, it takes a while and it's a bit stale. So would you want to do a similar thing here where you like load text to some warehouse and then go warehouse to vector database type thing? Exactly. Yeah, I think this works for every, like this, mo this general mm -hmm. model works for every source. So Notion could also be one of those sources. There's actually an, a pre-built Notion um, source in, in Airplay. Oh, you mean the like the the embedding part could also be part of those transformations? Is that what you're what you're getting? No, at? I mean so I mean like I think like we like we wrote a blog to or mo mostly you guys wrote a blog around doing I think it was like GitHub or but like let's let's imagine we're creating like a, a bot over like our Notion data and we set up some Airbyte ingestion. Like, should we set up like is the recommended way to go like Notion to vector database or Notion to warehouse and then warehouse to vector database? Given kind of like everything that you just said about transformation. Yeah, it depends on whether you need this intermediate step or whether the out of the box behavior works good enough. And um, also, like, I will get to, there. There's another slide which we shall get to in a second. But um, we also plan to to um, to basically distill the best practices and how to how to um, how to process these records when they're coming from a source into the destination. So for the simple things, you can just select them. One example, one good example is um, uh, markdown. Um, parsing, right? You want to, if you if you're chunking a markdown document, then you want to try to keep the sections together. And this is right. It's not supported right now, but it's it's on our shortlist to to add to the existing destination. So you can just select that. This is this is a transformation. I mean, sure, you could write some Python code to do this, but for the standard things, you can just you can just handle that as a configuration, and the transformations can focus on the on your specific business logic. So they don't need to do the normal things. But the the best practices are all um, encoded. Um, in in these pipelines, and then you're just working with the with the more complex bits that are like specific to your to business logic, and they can't be generalized. Right, moving on real quick. This is this is a, a small bonus that we didn't um, properly um, announce this yet, but we'll probably do so on, on early next week. Um, the, most of the sources, not all of them, but most of them are written in Python, which means you can also use them outside of the Airbyte service. Uh, so Airbyte is, like, the way you're, you're creating Airbyte connectors is by building a Docker image that um, behaves in a certain way when, when executed in a certain way. So that's the main interface. But in, in practice, a lot of um, sources are built using Python, which means we can just load them in a Python application as well. And we built a, a shim for that, basically, which is translating the interface of these sources to the interface of the Langchain loaders. So it's possible now to pull them in just like any other loader and load your documents on demand in your Python app, just as you can do it for, for all the other loaders as well. Um, the advantage of that is it unlocks a lot of loaders at once, right? Because most sources you can just use that way. And, and when you're using, when you're building your app on these loaders, what you can do is to, at some point when it becomes necessary, you can um, easily move this data extracting and loading into the background, basically into a background processing using a hosted Airbyte instance, and then you get all the benefits of the Airbyte platform I mentioned. But yeah, you don't need to start like this, but so the functionality is also available outside of it. And I think this actually answers the, the one of the questions asked right now, which is, can we use Airbyte? as only an orchestrated source aggregator and keep chunking, embedding, et cetera, for Langchain. And so, so this is one really good way to do that, where you can kind of like use all, like how, how many sources does Airbyte have? 300, 400, something like that? 300 something. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, and all, as, as Jim said, it's not, um, 
not not all of them are available here, but but a lot of the big ones are. Um, and then also like there's also I think the first integration we ever did with you guys was um, you can you can do um, you can still run all the sources and just dump them to some warehouse and then load from the warehouse and, and use that in, in Lang Chain. And so I think the first thing we ever did was dump it to a local JSON file and then uh, and, and then you can work with the JSON files just like you can in, in Lang Chain. So lots of lots of different uh, modes of integration depending on kind of like what what floats your boat. Absolutely, yeah. The whole like all of everybody is really modular, so you can integrate it in, in different ways that fits your needs. And so there's this is the loaders that are like just available as is right now as um, as loaders. We didn't add all of them yet. Um, there's some things we need to figure out to to have a, like a stable pipeline to publish updates um, automatically and all these things. But yeah, if there's there's an interest in in adding more loaders which are based on on Airbyte services, then it's it's not that hard to add them. So. Be free to link to each other if, if uh, you're missing something here. So yeah, that's that's where we currently at. Um, I already mentioned it a bit. Um, what we are currently thinking about is um, improving those vector DB destinations, having more options to embed to to embed the text chunks, having more chunking options available out of the box, so you can just use those best practices. Um, also, this is a little further out, but looking into how custom transformations can be done directly in that Airbyte pipeline. So if it's, I mean, if it's something really complex, right? You need to, um, you need to join data together from from a lot of different places. Then this is then Airbyte is not the right tool for you, and you need to dump the data somewhere, then do the transformations before loading them. But um, I think we can go further than than just having like a drop down with um, available options and allow the user to to write a bit of Python code for this. And the other thing where there's we identified a, um, some things where we can improve is um, having source connectors. And improving the existing connectors and adding new connectors uh, for typical sources for LLM use cases, for example, Google Drive or SharePoint or um, um, extracting from PDF files automatically. So that's where our mind is right now. So if you're interested in, in any of this, then you can reach out by filling out this quick survey that I linked here and then um, yeah, you can have a chat. Awesome. That's it the slide, so I will stop my screen share real quick. You guys should share the results of that survey. I'd be very interested to see that. That's uh, you know, some yeah, like uh, really interested to see kind of what uh, what's on what's on top of people's mind in terms of ingestion. All right, Kevin, I'm going to try unmuting you, and then let's see if let's see if the beeping yeah. noise is going away. Oh, all right, is you're good. Um, awesome. awesome. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no worries at all. So this is the second um, uh, uh, guest of the webinar. Do you maybe want to introduce yourself a bit, and then and then and then chat about Sweep yeah. and what you guys have been working on, and anything that you guys have mm -hmm. uh, prepared? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm Kevin. I am one of the co-founders of Sweep. Uh, I dropped out of Waterloo to work on Sweep full time. Oh, is my internet okay? Yep. Okay, sorry, it was just cutting out on my end. Anyways, um, yeah, so Sweep is an AI junior developer. Um, so you can basically make a GitHub issue saying the payment link on the landing page is broken, and the Sweep will make a PR to uh, fix the changes. So as you can imagine, it's a, uh, inherently around an RIG-based agent. Um, actually, I have some slides that can make this easier. I haven't used Crowdcast before. This should work. Uh, can you guys see this? Not. Yes. Now we can. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, basically get up issues or changes, and then you can give feedback, uh, and then you can also respond to get up actions. So there's kind of a lot of sources of input, and then uh, yeah, so. A quick demo of what we do with this loads. I can do a quick voiceover. Yeah, this is my co founder in the uh, videos, so but uh, I'll, I'll just be voicing over it. Basically, we have um, this short file. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead. 
Uh, you can make an issue description saying, hey, can you refactor this, make it more readable, add some doc strings. Um, then not only will it edit the file you asked, to, oh, sorry, not, let me rephrase that. Not only will it look at the file you asked it to edit, but it also um, uses our, uh, these retrieval models to fetch relevant similar files and then um, take those into account while editing the file you pass it to edit. Um, yeah, just to show the final output, it looks something like this. Add all the doc strings, add try accept blocks, et cetera. See how we get to full, uh, exit full screen. Oh, wait, there we go. Um, yeah, so we currently, these numbers are a bit outdated, but we're currently five, merging about 500 PRs a week um, through Sweep. Uh, as in, there's 500 production code changes into, um, into production every week uh, by our users. And just, and then onto the pipeline, um, essentially it looks something like this, where we have a set of inputs, the issue description, the repository code, et cetera, uh, goes into this retrieval system where it fetches all the relevant files based on the issue title and description. Uh, then it goes to planning, decides which files to edit, edits them one by one, and does a validation loop where it can restart the whole loop if uh, things don't go through. If there are, for example, errors in there, linting errors, um, or if the model, and we also have a self-review steps where it determines whether um, uh, whether uh, the, the changes reflect the, the actual intentions. Then finally, it goes off to the user, and when a user makes a comment, it goes, um, it does the loop all the way again, all, all the way from the search, uh, once again. By the way, I can't check the chat from here. Are there any questions? In the... um, none so far. I, th I think what we'll probably do is, is take questions at the end as well, so people should definitely put questions in the, in the question okay, box. Sounds good. And I might interrupt with some questions, but I think, uh, yeah, we can kind of go through the... Oh, yeah, for sure. Feel free to do so. Yeah, I don't have your uh, video, so I can't really read. The, so just feel free to come in. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, uh, just going to dive quickly into every step. Um, so for retrieval, we use mini LM plus a, um, a, a scorer to re rank based on the commit count and then uh, latest commits and age of files. It's actually slightly outdated as well. Uh, we use GC's base now, which is like, Slightly bigger than the uh, mini LM, but it's like better than NPNet. So it's like one of the one of the recent uh, models has been dominating the MTB leaderboard built by Alibaba. Um, we have some things, some format like this where we uh, give it all the uh, we give it the top four most relevant files, and then we have a repo tree, which is like a map of the repository. It's based on some, um, it's based on C tags, based on this uh, blog by a similar uh, tool called Aider. And what they what it basically does is kind of give you a tree of the, a concise tree of the repository with all the relevant files in there. And then for every very relevant file that does mention, it also collapses the, um, all the C tags, which like kind of shows the entities in each file. And then at the very bottom, we have the repository metadata. Uh, then we have a planning stage where JB4 basically decides which uh, files to create and modify based on the, um, the, the queries from the issue title and description. Then it kind of does, uh, JB4 does these like search and replace diff pairs where it takes, goes into the, the, the file and it determines every pair of, um, yeah, uh, every every section wants to modify, and then says what it, how it wants to modify it. Uh, and yeah, lastly, we have a validation step where it goes to self review, and then it checks against GitHub Actions to check if uh, all the linters, tests, whatever passes. Uh, and finally, it goes to the developer, and where the developer can. Uh, reply and can provide feedback in the comments. Uh, rest of the slides, I think, are, yeah, the rest of the slides are related to mostly prompts engineering. Um, 
Well, I, one I of, do that. Well, yeah. one of the things I think would be good to dive into on on the topic of kind of like ingestion is you guys wrote a really good blog post about kind of like how you ingest oh, yeah. data to do the retrieval step. And I think, you know, that's really important because if retrieval goes wrong, your application is also maybe not yeah, going to be amazing. Yeah. So do you want to maybe just like dive into that a little bit and, and what you guys did and how you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I have, I'm just going to pull up one of the uh, retrieval blocks. Okay, never mind. There's no uh, di cool diagrams there, but yeah, I'll just explain it um, without it. Um, so basically, yeah, our retrieval, so we actually, um, so our kind of current search system involves uh, fetching, so we first fetch the files at runtime because due to privacy reasons, we can't really persist the object. But, um, oh, I have to click it. It's, it's weird. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so our current, our current system involves, um, Basically, the entire repository at runtime, uh, chunking it, uh, and then we we do cache embeddings, which is the bottleneck. So the entire system is not like terribly slow. It's like uh, ten to twenty seconds, which is, um, but basically involves uh, fetching fetching files, chunking it, then um, embedding it, uh, indexing it into a um, into an active loop deep lake vector DB, uh, coordinating against front with the uh, um, with the uh, issue title and description, uh, getting all the relevant files, and then we go to a re ranker based on I think I indicated earlier based on the commit count and the each of the files and everything. Uh, and how many how many files do you like and, fetch and, originally? Yeah. And then. How many files do you fetch originally, and then after you re-rank them, how many are kind of like how many how many do you choose after that? Sorry, one second. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the last like ten-ish seconds? You just yeah, sure. Know, when you how many how many files do you fetch like originally, and then you do a re-ranking step, and how many files do you narrow it down mm -hmm. to? After? Mm -hmm. So we grab, uh, we had, we retrieve top 100, uh, and then we re-rank based on, um, yeah, the, the commit count, like we have a heuristic score, and then, uh, then we do, then we grab the top 10 to expand the T C tags for in the repo tree, and then for the top four snippets, we, sh we show it in the, um, we actually expand, like we actually show the whole snippet to the language model. Um, nice. Yeah, due to we actually can put more and just take advantage of their EDUK, but due to the loss of middle effects, it's kind of it leads to uh, worse results. So that's kind of that's why we do it. Um, nice. Yeah. Did you have other questions? Uh, I can go into like the jump into the chunker. Yeah, yeah, let's put for the chunker. I think that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have slides for this blog. I think I'll just pull up the blog because I have some examples in there that could be helpful. Yeah, so basically, um, the B default lang chain uh, chunker. Uh, what it does, it, it was based on the idea of the default lane chain chunker, which is like take this long file, break it um, based on a set of delimiters and like a decreasing priority order. So first it would be like double double new line represents like break between paragraphs, and then the next one would be uh, single new line, then periods which represent breaks between sentences, then spaces which is like words, and then uh, characters. And basically, it would break in this hierarchical fashion, and then refuse back, readily refuse back together until it's like uh, as close as close to the token or character limit as you you can be. Um, uh, so essentially, I took that idea and it was like this like um, hierarchical system is basically formulates a tree. So what if I uh, and our problem was that we wanted to chunk. 
uh, where this doesn't work super well because there's uh, of few reasons. And uh, for example, the, some of those reasons are um, you can't always rely on the same delimiters. Um, and then, yeah, that's, a, that's the main thing. And then also the delimiters, you, if you use split, it, it's removed from the entire system. Like you can add it back, but sometimes it's kind of ambiguous to where you add it back. So uh, what, I ended, what we ended up doing was building, realizing that this hierarchical system is basically a syntax tree. Um, but for, in, the, in that case, it would be like for, for natural language. And I guess a, a more generalization of that would be like syntax tree for codes. So uh, what we ended up doing was taking this, um, uh, taking the code, parsing it as a CSD, so concrete syntax tree, and then running basically the exact same algorithm where we um, like uh, first break it down into the parse and then greedily push it back together, uh, fuse it back together into until it matches, um, as, until it's as close to the max uh, character limit for us in this case as it can get. Um, and that became our chunker, basically. Um, to give some examples, uh, so a few of the problems that, yeah, this, yeah, this is the chain one, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so, so a few of the problems that arise when I was playing around with this was that sometimes it would line chain chunk, default chunker previously was, would be that um, it would break between like, uh, this is the start of the class, and then this is this would be the rest of the class. But then you kind of need the context of the class for the rest of the class to make more sense. So if it, if someone searched like uh, said something like write test for let's say the index dict uh, get summary method, it would kind of this would be disconnected. So the retrieval engine might not hit either of these. Um, whereas in the final output. Uh, Uh, as you can see, like this, the the class and the class methods stay together because um, because this is part of the same branch of the syntax tree, and it uh, how the algorithm works is that it does if it doesn't need to break up this, um, it, it basically doesn't ever split a um, a single branch of the syntax tree until it, it needs to. Um, so the only case where it would be would be. Uh, if this entire class is too big, then it has to break it up into sections. Um, I have more, I have some demos here. Uh, Do you maybe want to share the um, link to yeah. that blog in the chat as well? And then and then we can maybe move on to questions now, but people can explore that because it's, it's a very good blog. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, I'll just send this in the chat. Awesome. So let, let's go on to some general kind of questions now. So if people have them, please put them in the Q&A box on the right. I'm going to kind of like start uh, going, going through them and, and, and picking off the ones that, that look interesting. The top one, um, and, and these are kind of probably for both of you. Um, some may be for more one than the other, but um, extracting information for tables in a document. And so this maybe gets to the transformation step, Joe, that you were kind of like talking about. And Kevin, I don't know if you guys see this as much, um, but surely there's some, yeah, I don't know. General thoughts on tables and documents. How do, you, how do you guys think about that? So in general, I think this is, like if you have a document, then it's probably a PDF document or something. This is already challenging to parse because there's lots of different ways how this could internally be structured, which is like, you want to turn it into a text, right, into a string, and somehow, uh, but retain as much of the the, um, the structure, so the NLM can later reason reason about it. And there's libraries to help you with this. Um, right now, there's no built-in uh, source connector that will do all of these things with you. So I guess yeah, this is one of those things where you can plug in um, a transformation, which would make sense, right? So you you get it safe and sound into your warehouse and, and it, it might have all the information you need, but it's not imperfectly formatted. So later on the airline can reason about it, but then you need to have some custom logic for this or you know, try to um, use a library like, like the ones from, from Unstructure to, uh, <clears throat> to extract the relevant parts. 
Kevin, anything to add? Uh, not quite. Uh, but just to clarify, this is like, uh, by this do you mean something along the lines of, yes, yeah, so you have a set of PDFs and some of them tables of data for scientific reasons, let's say? Is that, is that yeah. the type of? Yeah, I think that's probably the main one that the question is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't. I, I don't really have. We don't really. Um, yeah, this one. Code it's easier because everything is already text, right? So it's it's already nicely formatted in that sense. So you don't mm -hmm. have that that part that yeah in the in the pipeline. This one's a bit more Airbright specific, but does Airbright have an HTML crawler slash scraper connector, um, which could be used to get all docs under a domain? If mm -hmm. not, is it planned? Yeah, I actually answered this one um, in, in a comment already. So there is um, a connector for um, API Fi, which is a crawling service. And basically, you do the, the crawling logic, like the, the configuring how which links to follow and how to extract the relevant information out of the web page in, in, the, in the runner on the API file site. And then this will produce records again, which are just JSON. And then those are, are moved through, through the pipeline. There's actually like a blog article, like the blog article you mentioned, Harrison is, is doing exactly that for, for the, the Airbyte documentation page. But yeah, I guess it's, it's pretty flexible because you can have custom extraction scripts in JavaScript written on the API by side to, to have the records already in roughly the right shape. And on this note, there's, an, there's another question about does Airbyte have a SharePoint connector? And so more, more generally, like where can people go if they want to see the full list of all the connectors that Airbyte yeah, I, has? And do you maybe want to put a link for that in the chat? I will definitely. There's, I don't think there's a SharePoint connector yet, but yeah, it's also on our short list. I, I also hit it on, on, on the slides because yeah, for this kind of use case, it's, it's obviously um, very relevant. Awesome. Um, and then this one's probably for you, Kevin. So you mentioned kind of like a ragged base agent. Did you use LangChain agent abstraction or build your own? I believe you guys built your own, right? And so do you, I think you had a, a kind of like slide about that, but do you maybe want to chat a little bit more about kind of like the, the architecture of, of your agent? Or can you repeat the last one? It's just my sort of the internet issues. Um, could you just chat a little bit more about how you arrived at the architecture for your agent and the thought process behind that and the different components? Yeah, so um, I guess the, the, the main reason we built it was just because um, you can tweak like whatever bits of it. It's extremely high flexibility built the entire um, right based agent. And uh, so it was just about, sorry, the question was just about how we, uh, like how we implemented it and like. Yeah, what's the, what's the architecture of your agent? Like, how, and how'd you arrive at that? And like, what did you try for, like, just anything about how, how, how you think about designing kind of like your agent architecture? Uh, sorry, I think my internet is acting up again. Can you, uh, uh, can you just skip this question for now? Sure, yeah, let's yeah. Let's, let's. Um, I see a, a few more questions around uh, Milvis in particular. Those are probably best answered offline. Um, and we're actually doing a webinar with Milvis and or Lance from our team is doing a, a webinar with Milvis in a, in, a, in a few, I think in a few days. Um, so I would encourage you guys to check that out for um, uh, any, any uh, Milvis specific questions. Um, I don't see too many more questions. So I think this is probably a good time to end it. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe and Kevin, you guys, for coming on. Um, really appreciate the time. Um, there's a lot of good links that were put in the chat, so I would encourage people to check those out. I'll probably add them to the YouTube description as well. Um, yeah, thank you guys for joining, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for having us.